Hey there, everyone, and thanks for joining me for another edition of Let's Make. Now, this month, it's Dangerous Dave, an early game from John Romero that I lost quite a bit of time to in junior high school. Now, as usual, I'll start off with a single playthrough of the game and describe the features as I see them. If you're already familiar with Dangerous Dave, you can skip to the end of the video where I'll lay out how we'll remake this classic. So this is a simple platformer, where the objective on each level is to collect this chalice or trophy, which unlocks the exit over here. Now along the way, you want to build score by chasing these collectibles. A Dave can walk in both directions, jump, and fall with a kind of a glide. Now notice the frame rate jumping around. At rest we see a frame rate of 7 due to the animated trophy up here that keeps updating. When we collect it, the frame rate appears to freeze at a high number, but actually the screen isn't updating at all. I'll take a step which forces an update, and Fraps detected this and updates the frame rate to 1. Now this game has a variable rate time step, which is efficient and maybe necessary back when this was made. We'll go with a more modern approach, I think. Let's finish this level. Now on level 2 we have hazards. It's possible to die by falling into the fire or the water. Let's go for the trophy and keep going. Now as Dave approaches the end of the screen, the view sweeps to the right. Now if you slow down DOSBox to maybe 20 cycles, you can actually see each tile redraw in row major. Now I won't do that here because DOSBox seems to become choppy after I speed it back up, but we're going to do something similar in our version. So here's a game stopper. If you didn't get the trophy and you fall down here, there's no way to get back to it. Now in a modern game, you'd expect some kind of Easter egg, such as behind the door over here, some place that takes you back to the start without having to restart the game. These games aren't that forgiving, though. Does anyone know what PCR stands for? Now level 3 brings us a weapon with the interesting limitation that only one bullet can be on the screen at a time. At short range we have a semi-automatic, and at long range we have a muzzle loader. Now, this is a pretty good indication that the bullet is treated as a, a static element in memory, and it's a design constraint that I plan on keeping in the remake. Over here we have our first actual enemy, Now I know when he pops out so I'm going to deal with him quickly. Enemies do shoot back, and I'll show you that over here on the next screen. So the spider guy shoots this ominous looking yellow beam that causes instant death. No problem for us, though. Now here's our first reflex test. The door's up here, and the trophy's down here. And next to the trophy is a jetpack, which brings us another new gameplay feature. Dave can now fly around with limited fuel. I'll grab these goodies and go to the door. Now, it's possible to fly off to the right and get stuck. Also, the jetpack can run out of fuel, and you're basically screwed at that point. You have no choice but to restart the game. Now level 4 puts the trophy in our face, but we can't reach it right now. If you try, you'll end up dying repeatedly until you figure it out. Instead, we have to go all the way to the other end of the level, get the jetpack, come back and get the trophy, and then run back again. Of course, there's an annoying enemy in the middle of it all, and you don't have a gun to kill him. Now when I was a kid, I would just used to waste a life here and suicide into the guy, which kills both of us. Dave comes back, but the enemy doesn't. Now here's the jetpack. Let's grab it and head all the way back. Now you'll notice the jetpack has a limited amount of fuel, and it's not possible to grab all the points in the level without running out of fuel. And once you're out of fuel, you can't win. That's an interesting game design philosophy, sort of like a soft form of permadeath. Except with an empty jetpack, you're already dead and you don't know it yet. Let's get past this guy one last time. And we could burn some fuel here and grab this wand for 500 points, but I'll pass. Let's finish the level.
Now, on level five, we get a new element. Dave can, Dave can climb certain things like trees. And he can also climb these stars over here somehow. All right, well, that didn't work out as planned. Uh, there's also a secret warp zone up here in the uh, top left. I'll pass on that too, though. Another bad guy. Let's take care of him. All right, got lucky. That usually takes me a couple of shots. Well, that didn't work out as planned. Jumping across a screen boundary is risky in this game. Sometimes I feel like Dave changes his glide speed when the screen changes, or maybe I'm just not very good at this game. I'm just going to keep shooting at this guy until he goes down. Unfortunately, these levels are completely deterministic. You can rely on the same thing happening at the same time always. Well, I wonder if anyone's ever tried to train an AI to find the shortest path through this game. Or we could just YouTube Dangerous Dave speedruns. I'm sure someone's done it. I'll grab the jetpack and head over here. Now another interesting feature, or exploit, is that Dave can walk outside the level boundary. Now we can use that to skip all the danger and go right to the end, but this isn't helpful if you're chasing the high score. It's a subtle design choice. We can attempt to win or attempt to maximize score. Now finishing levels is actually worth 2,000 points, which I think is a greater reward if you have to choose it. Of course, nothing beats doing everything. Now in level 6, we get an enemy in our face at the start. We have to quickly grab the jetpack and the gun to deal with him. Now notice that enemy was always moving back and forth. Now all the enemies in the single level follow the exact same path, and that's hard-coded into the level. We'll see that. We see there's three more of these guys following the same path. Now I usually end up dying on this level simply because of all the enemies around. This guy down here is guarding the trophy. Lots of red herrings that we can chase and burn jetpack fuel. But on this level, you need to save almost all of your fuel in order to reach the exit. Now we can run back to the start screen where the door is. Again, we have to use most of our fuel to get there. Finish up. Now level 7 gives us another annoying starting position. Most of my games end on level 6, so I'm not very fresh with these levels. For such a simple game, I do appreciate the number of interesting situations you can get into. I'll risk using the jetpack to avoid all the danger here. I'm on a roll, so hopefully I can keep it going. On level 8, we don't have to deal with any immediate dangers, but one thing I know is that some of these purple platforms are fake and Dave will fall right through. I'll try to avoid them at all costs since I don't have these memorized. Now yet another gameplay feature is that Dave can fall through the bottom of the level and it wraps around back to the top. And we'll need to do that to keep going. Now let me walk to the right outside of the level and see if I can skip everything. No, no, I think I remember I have to go through all this. I'll take another risk and jetpack through everything. Okay, level 9, and I know for a fact that I'll fall through the floor here. I'll try and keep off the platforms as much as possible. I don't have any lives left. I'm pretty sure a lot of these platforms are fake. I'm not going to risk anything. I'll grab the trophy and hopefully avoid the noid on all these remaining platforms. I think my luck's about to run out.
All right, last level, and I earn an extra life at 40,000 points. Now, I know that this level is complicated, and even though they start you next to the exit, you can't get to it. Fall through the floor again. I know there's a warp zone if you go to the left that takes you to a treasure room, but you end up having to come back here anyway. Which way to go? I think I'll opt to skip the bad guy if possible. Okay, well here's the gun that I can use to get past him. Or not. Let's see if I can uh, take advantage of the shady hit detection. All right, that worked out. Not a bug, gameplay feature. Okay, that's the bug, broken floors. All right, well, that's the end of my run, and I'm happy I got to the last level on a live recording. So we'll start with our remake by extracting some of the game assets from the original binary. Now as you can see here, we only have a 75 kilobyte executable and another file that, won't, that we won't use. Now in the next two videos, we'll build utilities to take the graphics assets and level data out of the binary that we'll use in our own implementation. Now for the programming, I'm going to impose a couple of interesting constraints to keep this project in theme with the game and the era it was developed. We're only going to use C and we'll stick with very basic language features. Now using C means we won't have direct support for objects and methods. However, I'm going to take this project a step further and I'm not going to use any dynamic elements at runtime. No function pointers, no memory allocators, no data structures that can resize themselves as needed. We'll call Malik on startup and sketch the game in a fixed memory block. Now a game as simple as Dangerous Dave can be specified with basic procedural code in a few hours thanks to libraries like SDL. The programming itself is something a beginner can follow as long as you have basic knowledge of C. So, let's go make Dangerous Dave.